let's do some research. So there was a group of 300 psychiatrists who were meeting a month later, and I said, let's take all the diagnoses that we have in psychiatry, and there are only about 30 of them, they're not so many, and let's ask the psychiatrist to self-diagnose themselves according to the scales of mental illness. And believe it or not, no one's ever done such a thing. So we took the, the 30 diagnoses, and we asked the psychiatrist to self-evaluate themselves on a scale of 0 to 5 if they had some form of psychiatric illness. What percentage of psychiatrists do you think said they had some form of psychiatric illness? 5%? 10 percent 80 would agree, would admit that they themselves had some form of psychiatric illness. Okay, so let me tell you, 89% said that some form of psychiatric illness. I'm one of the 11% that's completely okay, but 80, 89%, but not five, two, three, and you know what? It's not, what, psychiatrists are little, no, it's not true. I don't think that's any different from the regular population, because all of us have some form of something at some point in our lives. A little bit of depression, a little bit of anxiety, a little obsessive stuff, uh, anxiety, personality, eating disorders. It's part of the human condition. And what makes it to be a psychiatric illness? Whether it affects our function. It's part of the human condition. The studies show that about 47% of the population at some point of their lives, that's about, it's us, right? Half of us at some point of our lives are going to have some form of psychiatric condition that affects our function, that becomes a focus of attention, of clinical attention. Which means it's part of the human condition. Just like there's nothing to be ashamed of, and there's nothing to say, okay, someone has high blood pressure, or someone gets the flu, sometimes people get psychiatric illness. And it's okay, because it can be treated and can be managed. What's the problem? That things don't get managed, and that do things don't get treated, because of the stigma, and because of people, the bouchard, because of the, the shame associated with it. And therefore, people suffer twice. They say, not only am I suffering now from the condition, but I'm suffering because I'm not going out to get the help, and I'm not reaching out, and that help is out there. And people are not getting that help. So, so I've been in the field of psychiatry for about 30 years. And let me, t let me tell you two things. If you go to any country in the world, and you say to the Minister of Health, you say, what's the commonest diagnosis of people in, in your country right now in the hospital. So what would you say? If you go to, you go to any, any country in the world, what's the commonest diagnosis of someone in a hospital today in England? What would you say in this area? Heart attack, pneumonia, broken bones, cancer, God forbid. It's actually, it's actually schizophrenia. But people don't talk about it. Let me tell you about the area where I live. Okay, in the, in the, in the, in the middle, middle of Israel. How many people in the hospital right now in Israel with heart attack? 120. How many with pneumonia? 150. We're going to some, it goes a little bit less. How many with cancer? Pl close to 200. How many with broken bones? Also between 100 and 150. How many with schizophrenia? 600. But people don't talk about, shh, we don't talk about mental illness. Why? It's a secret. In 30 years in psychiatry, you know that if you go into in the hospitals in Israel, in the center of Israel, the big hospitals, Ichilov, Tel Shomer, Balenson, Hadassah in Jerusalem, you know you go into a hospital, you can buy Coke from the machine, right? Do you know that when you go into the hospitals today, these beautiful big modern hospitals that look like hotels, it's probably like similar to here, I know it's definitely like that in America where I studied, you can, you can buy, you know, you, go, you can buy flowers, you can go to the hospital, the lobby, and you go put some money and it comes out flowers and you give it to someone because that's what you do, right? You need to be kocholim. I have never in my 30 years of psychiatry ever seen anyone bring flowers to someone in the psychiatry ward. Why? Because psychiatry, you don't, we don't go there. I, you know, if I ever asked you now to put up your hands, how many of you ever done Biko Cholim in a regular hospital? I'm sure many of you have, have been, right? You've visited someone with, right? You know, all bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvah boys that do a project, that they visit the elderly, they visit sick people, not psychiatry. So when my daughter had a bat mitzvah two years ago, for a year before that, I adopt, I, uh, she adopted someone with schizophrenia in a hostel. And once a week she used to go visit this elderly lady in a hospital in a hostel because no one else would go visit because it's psychiatry, because of the stigma. And it doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be like that because people don't need to suffer. Do you know that in Israel, 
in Israel, how many people die from car accidents every year? Do you want to know? How many people die in car accidents every year in Israel? 365. It's about one a day. The figures last year, I think, were 384. A little bit worse. The year before, they're about 360. It's about one a day. Do you know how many people die from suicide every year? From what we know, it's about double, two to three times. But do you know how much money is given for prevention of car accidents in Israel? There's a whole department in the government. Millions and millions. But do you know how much money is given for suicide prevention in Israel? Nothing. Okay, and you go to the big psychiatry, big hospitals, big general hospitals. They're beautiful, like hotels. And you know, every door of it has this plaque, you know, donated by some wealthy individual from in America. But a psychiatry hospital, it's neglected. There's six to ten people per room, one shower for a room full, of, for a ward full of thirty to forty individuals. At night, there are two staff members, so patients get a little irritable or agitated because they want their cigarette or they want some chocolate and they go and they get they get restrained there was this terrible um, scandal going on in Israel last year or two because they neglected the psychiatry because we don't talk about it and that's what my neoshua came to say just because someone has psychiatric illness doesn't mean that they should be have substandard conditions in the hospital so they opened up and they said okay we're going to have two per room we have good conditions. There's no reason that psychiatric individuals shouldn't shouldn't have good conditions. And I just give one other example, and this is something that that's a very sensitive issue, but it happens to be a hobby of mine, and I think it's something that that people should know about. When you talk about even the Holocaust, and every 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 city in the world that respects itself has a museum for the Holocaust. But do, do you know the whole idea for gas chambers? Where did that come from? Where did the whole idea of gas chambers come from? Where did it come from? It came from the mentally ill. Long before, when I say long before, years before they started with the Jews, okay, and the terrible, the terrible, the extent of what happened, the, the doctors in, 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 in Germany, and I mentioned this to someone before, were gassing the mentally ill. But people don't talk about that so much. It started with the mentally ill, and then it moved over to the Jews. And I really believe it wasn't for the doctors and the psychiatrists, the state of the Holocaust would not have been, because the whole idea of the gas chambers came from, came from the psychiatrists, from the psychiatry hospitals. Remember, the, the, the final solution was in January. The conference of Wannsee was in January 42. But that started in 39 to 41 with gas chambers and the whole idea moved over. I'll tell you one little interesting fact and then I'll move on to talk to a psychiatry. When you talk about there was only one concentration camp that was, it was run by a doctor. People don't know this. When you talk about medicine and the Holocaust, you talk about how do, what do people think? What do people say? Right? Who do people know the name of one name in the Holocaust of a doctor? Mengele, right? Mengele was a terrible man. He was evil and he did terrible things in experiments and selection. But there was someone who compared to, who Mengele was small fry compared to this guy. And let me tell you about this. And you, hear, you haven't heard of him. Because I'm, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it's an absolute stain and shame on the medical profession and in psychiatry in particular. There was only one concentration camp that was run by a doctor. Did you know that? Did you know which one it was and what his name was? Asperger. Sorry? Asperger. No. Now Asperger, Asperger is, was a neurologist working in Austria, but he never headed a gas chain. He never headed a concentration camp. Um, that's another interesting story on itself. We can talk about. We won't talk about that. But Treblinka was actually set up by a doctor, and and his name was Infred Ebel. And what kind of doctor was he? He was a psychiatrist. And he was considered to be the most successful of all concentration camp commanders. Why? Con successful. He killed 280,000 Jews in six weeks. No one even came close to it. In Auschwitz, in the, in the peak of its action, no, nothing came close to what happened to 280,000 Jews in six weeks. So how did Dr. Ebel, which you've never heard of, and nor did I until I started um, researching about him, and I wrote, I wrote about him in the medical literature for the first time ever a few years ago, why, did, why was he so successful? How did he manage to kill 280,000 Jews in six weeks? By the way, he was fired after six weeks. Because he was so successful at killing Jews, he, the, the, the mounds of bodies were piling up and the stench, so they fired him. Because you are, you kill, 
you can't get rid of it. That's not, that's not considered uh, functional, so they fired him. But how did he manage to kill so many in such a short time? Because, as he said, he used to walk around in a white coat. And when the people saw someone in a white coat, they just went. And they listened to it because he was a doctor. People trust doctors. So, so, and his, his experience was from running a psychiatry hospital. So, so he ran a psychiatry hospital. He had the experience and therefore he was hired to set up Treblinka and that's what he did. Back to mental illness and psychiatry <coughs> today. Mentally ill, and, 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 and why did I mention this? Because there's no way in the world that anyone talks about what happened to the Jewish mentally ill. It just doesn't exist. So now in Israel, I'm trying to set up an exhibition also to talk about the mentally ill and the Jewish mentally ill, what happened, because no one talks about it. When you go to Yad Vashem, they say, you know, we, we don't deal with the mentally ill, we deal with the Jews. So then I say, what happened to the Jewish mentally ill? So they say, nothing different happened to the Jewish mentally ill, but actually they did. They suffered double. They were the doubly cursed. <coughs> So, so what, what I personally in my life have taken upon myself is to say, no, I want to say the mentally ill don't have to be cut out and put on the side and locked up and forgotten about them. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And right now in the middle of B'nai Brak, they set up this big psychiatry hospital on the campus of, of, of Mane Ashura. Now, when I, I was recruited... Um, I mean, it's new. It's the newest psychiatry hospital in the country. I was recruited by the minister at the time to go uh, and encourage to move over to, to Hedisa just over a year and a half ago. And, and my name issue is different for, for, for a number of reasons. First of all, it's a paradigm shift in the, in the Frum community because up until now, the Frum community said mental illness, we don't want to talk about it, and it's not us. And people weren't getting their, getting their help, and people were taking mashkanta, how do we say mashkanta in English? Uh, mortgage. mortgage to go see these big psychiatry doctors, professors, privately, and rather than going through um, public health. I'm a big believer in public health. I don't think people should go privately necessarily because the services exist. But because of the, the, the potential of, 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 of uh, shame and the information getting out and the stigma, people weren't going through the public health sector. And therefore, we're going to, and, and they weren't getting the management through a team approach. So Manasha said, no, let's set up a new hospital. Let's be open. Let's break down that stigma. Let's give them good conditions. There's no reason why someone with mental illness should be treated in the substandard conditions. So therefore, they have these very advanced conditions and, 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 and good infrastructure. But, and the patients get it for free. The Kupat Cholim, the... The, the, the mental health funds pay for all of the services. Setting up the hospital is a different story, but the services itself are paid for by, are paid for by the mental health funds. So the patients get the same services where they go to the Ministry of Health or they go through these um, non-profit organizations like Hadassah and Maneshua. Maneshua is like Hadassah, it's a non-profit institution. Number two, and this is probably the most important difference, is that Cultural sensitivity is the name of the game today. If you're treating someone and you don't understand their background, where they're coming from, you can make big mistakes. So Manashua says, no, okay, we want to be understanding of where the people are coming from, and we want to allow people in the Orthodox world to also have cultural sensitive management. Today in Israel, everyone's sensitive, and around the world, to the Russian population and to the Ethiopian population, and to the, 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 the immigrants from here, and to the Arab, and that's all very good. But what about the Frum population? There are no services in Israel that, that dedicated itself to the, to the management of the Frum population. And why is that important? Because cause some mistakes can be made. Not only does the patient sometimes not feel that they're being sense, that, that, that the staff are being sensitive to them, but the mistakes can be made. I, I, I'll give you an example. So, so, so I, I, I have a hobby on the side that I, I'm fascinated by obsessive compulsive disorder. So we have this family unit and I was referred to someone through the family unit. Let me just tell you a minute about the family unit. What happened is that in the clinics we used to see a patient like a child here and a child there and then someone in the ward and then at the end of the day we found, wow, you know, if you've got a family of 10 to 12, 15 sometimes, 8 children, they're all part of the same family. And if you're treating with just this child there or that parent there and that, uh, that aunt, 
you, you're dealing with the same family. Let's deal with the family in itself. Let's deal with them all together. And why is that important? Because you're not just dealing with illness and saying, okay, that's identified patient and it's all around that patient. No, we're dealing with the unit. And therefore, in some ways, you destigmatizing the illness. You're saying, we all have an issue to deal with. Let's deal with it together. Let's see how each of you fit into this part of the family and how can we help this person and how can we help ourselves within the context of this family. And how do we do that? We don't do that by sitting in a, in a cold clinical room where the family come and sit down in a circle of the desk in between the doctor, the social worker, the psychologist. Mane Oshua built an apartment with a bedroom and a kitchen and a lounge. Oh, it's so wonderful to speak proper English now because with Americans you can't say lounge, you have to say salon. And you, and, and, and you, and you have a study. <coughs> so and, 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 there, and with, with cameras, so you teach, and you teach parents how to deal with the children, and you teach children how to deal with the parents, and you teach children how to deal with each of them, and you deal with the family theory within the context of a home, and it's not as cold clinical room. So in, in some way, there's also somewhat of a paradigm shift in approach to family therapy. So, what, what, why, so, so why did I mention that? Because I was referred a case of, a fa of, of the father who couldn't come to this because he was st staying in his apartment. And he's been sitting in his apartment for a year and a half. Now, a year and a half sitting in an apartment? So what, what's going on here? What, why is he staying in his apartment for a year? He hasn't left his bedroom in a year and a half. <coughs> he's left it from the bedroom to the kitchen, bedroom to the kitchen. And it, I came out that not only was he a highly functioning individual, but he was considered to be one of the Tamidei Mufak, one of the star students at a very, very prominent yeshiva in Israel. So what's the story? I said, no, he's a very sick man and he can't. So it comes out that a year and a half ago, he started having this belief that every time he went to the street, he was married to every woman that he saw on the street. So the family said, wow, this is serious illness to think. And, he, and why? Because he was so scared, he was married to every woman he saw on the street. He stayed in an apartment. So the family said, wow, this guy's sick. We need to take him to the big psychiatry doctors to look after him, to treat him. So they went to this doctor and they went to that doctor. And each of them saw him as being psychotic. This is completely out of touch with reality. You're a very intelligent guy, but you go to the street and you think you're married to every woman that you see in the street. And because of that, it so much bothered him. He stayed in an apartment, going to all these psychiatrists, getting treatment more and more and more for psychosis getting worse and worse and worse on the medication and then staying there for a year and a half and not leaving his apartment for a year and a half. And can you imagine what this does to the family unit? It affects everyone. It affects obviously Shalom Bias with the wife and the children. So what's the story? It comes to us. I met with him. You sit down and you listen to the story. The first rule. Listen to the person. What's the story? He was learning second parak of Kiddushin where you can be married to a woman with Shaveh Prutza. Now we get married with a ring, but you can get married with anything. I can get, I can give this to a, to my potential wife and, and be married with that. I can marry her with a watch. Anything of Shaveh that's worth a Prutza. So he thought that he was a good looking guy and that every woman that he saw in the street would see him and would give as if to look at him Shaveh Prutza and if he was a Safek Mukudash with any woman that he saw in the street. Now that sounds completely out of touch with reality, right? But how do we know that that's not psychosis? And how do we know that that's an obsessive thing? Because it really, really bothered him. And number two, he knew it was irrational. But it didn't help. And that's the nature of obsessive compulsive disease. That you understand, the person understands it's irrational. And it really bothers them. But what's the problem? If you don't understand where the person is coming from, from their culture, and here in terms of halacha, you completely mismanage the condition. Because you're treating him as if he's a psychotic individual, and he's not psychotic individual. He's not out of touch with reality. He recognizes it's irrational, and it really bothers him. That is not psychosis. That is OCD, and the management is completely different. So the part, what you do, you stop this antipsychotic medication, starts coming out. You give him anti-obsessive medication, within four to six weeks, he's back to complete function. So, so that's what, so it's not that, it's not that, that, that the doctor who, in, the, in that situation, what we're doing in our clinic, to say, we, 
just that we're sensitive to the culture where the people come from. So in Manei show we're saying, no, we want to offer services to the Frum population in Israel, which doesn't exist as a specialty unit. We open to everyone. In fact, Manei Yeshua is the first, is the only psychiatry institution in Israel that's really open to the whole country, because usually in psychiatry in Israel, the hospitals go by catchment areas. We open to everyone because services don't exist for the Frum population all over the world, so we open up to everyone. We are, we are open to everyone, not just from people, but by the nature of the atmosphere and the services we exist, it's just natural that the people who come to us are from the Haredi mostly and in the, in the Dati Lumi, in the national religious population as well. That's number one. And number two, and this is what was a clincher for me and why I went there. And I think this, I think in a way, is mostly changing, I think, the face of psychiatry management in Israel. And Israel, in some ways, is very backward in this, in terms of, in terms of where the world exists. And I think now we're moving even ahead, when I say the world psychiatry. And, and, and Mane Shura is the only psychiatry institution in the country where there's no coercion. The people want, people, there's no coercion in the hospital, no forced treatment. People come to the hospital and get treatment because they agree to it. And there's no restraints. Um, we have to have a seclusion room of uh, nature of what the, the government, the Ministry of Health determines. And, and, and we've used it in the last almost two years, six times for 15 minutes. Now in Israel, sometimes there's been a big scanners going on. People have been restrained sometimes for 30 to 40 days. And we, we've done it, we haven't used that seclusion room since for the last nine months. Just doesn't, not necessary. If you train the staff and you have lots of staff, psychiatry doesn't need to be um, a, a field where you deal with restraints. So, so, that, that, so that, that's what we offer. You don't need to have coercion to manage people. And it's a different approach to the thing. Right from the day one, we work in rehabilitation. So if, for example, the management um, part of rehabilitation is helping the person get onto a bus and pay, 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 paying for the bus ticket or going to studies and listening in a class, Part of what the rehabilitation that we do from day one is helping a person dive it again and helping a person learn again. So we have a person, just like we have animal therapy and, 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 and garden, and horticultural therapy and music therapy and art therapy and exercise therapy. What, Haredim do exercise? Absolutely. It's, a, it's the only room in the ward that I lock because it has to be done with supervision. Um, three times a day we have someone who comes and who supervises the patients on the inpatient units and they do exercise. I thought that was my stigma. By the way, stigma is sometimes the biggest amongst the psychiatric care pr uh, pr uh, providers themselves. I had stigma as well then. I, 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 learned, I learned a lesson two things. By the way, I learn all the time. I just learned something tonight about having pictures of, of people in the room when they're young, how the staff you know, r relate to patients in a better way if they see pictures of, of elderly, sta or elderly patients when they're young. So we, we learn all the day, and I'm, I like that idea. I'm going I'm to bring that back. Um, but but I, I learned, for example, my stigma was I thought, ah, already, they're not going to use the exercise room. It's the only room they want to be there all the time. By the way, we're also the first psychiatry hospital in the country that doesn't lock doors. You know, in, I, I've worked in six different countries. As you can hear, I grew up in a treehouse in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I trained in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, in America, and uh, I worked in Canada, and here. I was at the Maudsley many years ago, and the Maudsley did, I don't know what happens today, but the Maudsley did that in those days as well. Patient gets up in the morning, they lock their door and they open it up again in the afternoon. It's done all over Israel, for sure in America where I train. It's part of what is done in the psychiatry wards. Why? Because you say if the patient, if you, if you didn't unlock the door, if you didn't unlock lock the door, the patient would spend the whole day in the, in the room. It's not true. Or they they do things to themselves, or they or they they hurt other people, and I and I studied and we did we published on it. It's just not true. There's there's no reason. I think it's a basic human right to have access to your bedroom the whole day. So we open the rooms the whole day, but the the exercise room we lock. So by the way, that's the first stigma that I was wrong. And the second stigma is we built the psychiatry ward with a separate wing for families. So it's the first wing, the first the first ward in the country that has a separate section for families. So we said, you know, in the afternoon, families would come, visit their patients, visit their family members, and we'd have a separate room for them, for them to meet, to, to be alone with the families. 
and we had we could you could not you could close it off in the afternoon, and I was completely wrong, because because the opposite families very very much want to meet with other families want to share experiences. We started off by having meetings once a month, went down to once every two weeks, and now we have once a week meetings with families where they get together and they share notes, they share experiences, and they share what they go through. And we have professionals who sit with them and help them and and and, and go go through what what mental illness is about. So stigma is often within us and self. So the family unit is a very big focus of what we're doing. And that's something that's, that, that's, uh, that, that, that's new and that we've set up in this apartment. What's the problem in Israel? Family therapy is completely neglected in the country. But Mane Oshua says no. Even though it's neglected and it's not paid for, we see it as important. Now why is it neglected and not paid for? Why is it not dealt with? Because the Ministry of Health says... With the, and this is reform in psychiatry that's happened there. We will, we will, we will cover treatment for an illness, for for illness, just like cancer or pneumonia or broken bones. We will cover that. And psychiatry too, depression, schizophrenia, uh, uh, manic depression, bipolar. We will treat it. But family therapy, it's not a diagnosis. We don't cover it, and they don't, and they don't. So social workers and psychologists can only see people privately. So the average person cannot see someone through the, through the, the national health system. But Mane Yeshua says something different. We are a community hospital. We, we, we don't, we, we different from a regular hospital. That A regular hospital sets itself up and says, these are the services we have, come to us if you need us. Mane Yeshua started in 1992 because it was in Bnei Brak and there were a lot of births. They said, there's a need in the community. Let's set up, set up an obstetrics ward. Then a few years later, they set up a surgical ward. And a few years later, a medical ward. And then now the cherry on the top for Dr. Rothschild is the psychiatry ward. Because they <coughs> looked at the psychiatry hospital, seven stories. I said, mm. there's a need in the community. Let's set it up. So the same thing too, the family unit. There's a need in the community. The families with our, what they're called, uh, blessed with children. They're big families. We they, they they need the family therapy, and we and we opened up. So now we we not only are opening up to treat people, but we see ourselves as a national center for training. And many different places send their students and learn within the context of that, and 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 that's what we have: video cameras, etc., etc. Um, I I I'll just I'll just I'll just end off with 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 with, with saying this. We, when, people, when people suffer from mental illness, not only do they suffer from what they're going through with themselves, but they suffer from, from, from the loneliness and from, 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 not, from not having other people sharing with what they're going through. Because part of what, what it means to be <coughs> sick is to say, I'm not alone and someone's with me and they can give me that word. But patients in the psychiatry ward and, psychi and suffer from that, not just in the ward, out there in the community as well. They, 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 they don't have that. When I mention 47% of the population, it's you and me, with some form of significant illness, which, is a, which becomes a focus of clinical attention in some, at some point in their lives, two-thirds of them, two-thirds of them don't get the help that they're supposed to get. Only about a third do get that. And that's really, really, really... And it th doesn't have to be like that. So, so we're saying... We're saying we want to go out to the community. We want to try and make that difference. We want to try and give that, give that in a, with an ethical basis. And we want, to tr we, want to, we want to change the face of psychiatry, not just in the FUM community, but, but, in, but in clinical medicine in general in Israel. We're at the beginning of our route. I head the National Ethics Committee in psychiatry, and that's part of what we're trying to do. I've just written a code now for ethics in, in Israel, which doesn't exist. I was part of the international committee that just rewrote the international medical oath and part of the international medical oath changed three things changed first of all for the first time ever ever in the international medical oath and this is actually based in germany where we changed it which is now it's international we respect autonomy in other words it's not just the doctor deciding for the patient number two the doctor has to look for the after himself and number three and this is the most important thing a doctor has an ethical duty to share their knowledge with the community. And that's what we're doing now. We say we need to go out and teach the Rabbonim when, when there's psychiatric illness and when to refer. We need to go out to the community and to say, you know, 
It's nothing to be ashamed of. If we've got 13,000 births a year in our hospital, it's one every 45 minutes, the biggest number of Jewish births in the country in Israel, more Jew, more, there are more Jewish births in my neighborhood than any other place in the country. There's a lot of postpartum conditions. And it's nothing to be ashamed of. And it can be treated and be managed. So we, that's what we open. So we open up and we say these things can be helped. Thank you very much for coming to hear me tonight and to hear some of what we're doing. And uh, I hope if any of you come to visit, it will be, be good to see you. And it's okay to bring flowers. <laughs>